when I was in TCM school, my teachers used to say there are no wrong treatments in Chinese medicine, only the wrong diagnosis. The key to have a successful outcome for all our patients starts with the diagnosis. And that's probably the hardest part in Chinese medicine. Today, I'm diving deep into the heart of Chinese medicine diagnosis, breaking down the complexity into a practical nine-step framework that you can apply with each of your patients and get great results. Whether you are a practitioner who are still trying to refine your skills or TCM students who still baffle by diagnosis like I was when I was in school, this framework is a game changer and I can't wait to go through each of the steps with you today. Welcome back to my channel. If it's your first time here, I'm Clara from AcuPro Academy and I create Chinese medicine and acupuncture content for students and practitioners, making it easy to grasp and fun to learn. Let's go. In TCM, pattern differentiation and making the right diagnosis can be done according to the nine following options. The yin-yang theory, the five elements, the four vital substances, the zongfu organs, the pathogens, the six stages, four levels, the three jaws, and or the meridians. These are the nine steps we're gonna look at today, and I'm gonna go through each of them and show you how easy it is to make a TCM diagnosis using the nine step frameworks. Let's do it. Let's start with each consultation, which you use your methods of inquiry, palpation, observation, olfaction, and auscultations. Once you have this done, you need to put the diagnosis. And as you know, it's kind of like a puzzle and it feels like it's so hard to figure out. So let's start with the basics. Always start with the yin yang theory. This is the basics. Right? And we're looking at the eight principles. The eight principles are yin and yang, hot and cold, internal, external, deficiency, excess. You start with those. So let's start first with internal versus external. Internal is going to affect all the organs, the brain, the reproductive system, while external is going to affect the muscular skeletal system, like the bones, the muscle, the joint, the ligament, the tendons, the skin, that's more external. So if someone comes in with carpal tunnel syndrome, that's more external, even though it could be a chronic issue. Or someone comes in with menstruation pain, like dysmenorrhea, that's an internal, okay? So you decide what the chief complaint is about because you wanna address first the chief complaint. Of course, all the other symptoms are gonna make a picture and put the puzzle together, but first we wanna know what this person has come for. Right? If they came for insomnia, insomnia is usually an internal problem. If they came because they have sciatica, that's usually external. Make sense? Okay, so once we decide if it's internal versus external, we're going to look at is it more cold, more hot? Meaning, can it come from yang deficiency, which that's why the person is always cold, or is this excess yin, which means the person is cold, but in one area, it's localized. So is it that the person is cold all the time, all over the body, and they like warm food, warm drinks, and they like to be warm? Or is it that they are cold in one area, like with Reynolds disease, which is yin excess or excess cold, versus the first one is yang deficiency. Make sense? Or it is excess yang or yin deficiency, meaning it's the hot person, right? So yang excess would have big symptoms, red face, anger, insomnia where the person doesn't sleep at all all night, there's a red tongue with yellow coat, while yin deficiency is gonna be more irritability, toss and turn all night, red cheeks, and no coat on the tongue. So we differentiate those two, and then we decide is this more of heat or cold, depending if it's excess or deficiency. So the eight principles, we're gonna look at deficiency and excess, which we have decided if it's cold or hot, deficiency or excess, and the problem is internal or external. Once you've got this, you have a little bit of a better idea. This is your first step of that framework. Second step. Now that we know that, let's say, it's insomnia, it's an internal problem, and the person is always on a hot side and it's excess yang or excess heat, let's look at why. 
The five element theory is the key to figure out where it all started. So when we look at the five elements, if you look at someone that comes and sees you for low immune system, they are saying, I'm always sick, I get colds and flus, and it takes me weeks to recover. That's an immune system or a way chi, a defensive chi that is not strong enough to fight pathogens. So in this instance, we know that it is the metal, lung and large intestine element that is affected. Now, what is the root cause? Now we can look back and with all our, our inquiry, we realize that this person's diet is not feeding or generating a good immune system. They don't have a proper nutritious diet. So that's earth, the digestive system, spleen and stomach, not generating a good immune system. So when we treat, we want to treat the immune system, but we also want to treat the digestive system. So now we have two things to look at. But why is this person not eating properly? Maybe it's because they're really stressed. So stress affects the liver and gallbladder, which is the wood element. The wood in the five element theory over controls spleen and stomach, creating some issue with spleen and stomach. And in turn, spleen and stomach or earth cannot generate a good immune system. So now we have to treat the liver gallbladder or the stress. We have to treat the digestive system and we have to treat the immune system. The five element always tells you where it all started. So now you have clues of what to look for in the next key frame from that ninth step. So the next step is to look at the four vital substances. We have four vital substances, chi, blood, body fluid, and essence. Now it's very easy to start with essence. I'm going to go backward, but essence is either we are deficient or we're not. And you know that the deficiency sign when it comes to essence is really going to be low libido, having reproductive system issues, having gray hair early in life, not straight teeth, bone issues, anything that's related to essence, aging faster is going to be your essence deficiency. That's an easy one. Either there is or there isn't. Now, body fluid can either be excess or deficient. Excess is too much dampness and deficiency leads to dryness. Easy. So if you see mucus and a lot of excess body fluid, it's excess dampness. If you see a lot of dryness, it's dryness, it's body fluid deficiency. Super easy. Maybe there's a balance between dampness and dryness and you don't see anything. That's great. The next one is blood. Blood can be deficient, can have heat, or it can be stagnated. So that's easy. Now, what happened when it's deficient? Pale and poor. Pale face, pale lips, pale tongue, poor sleep, poor energy, poor memory, poor vision. You decide, is blood being affected and is blood deficient? Now, the next one is blood stasis. Blood stasis is pain and purple. Is your purple tongue, purple nails, purple lips, and is a local fixed pain like dysmenorrhea or sciatica or an ankle sprain if it was acute. Blood heat, on the other hand, means that there's going to be abnormal bleeding with heat sign. So abnormal bleeding, maybe rectal bleeding, blood in the urine, uh, heavy, heavy flooding menstruation, nosebleeds, that is associated with heat. We're feeling hot, red tongue, rapid pulse, irritability, that shows you blood heat. And the last one is chi, and chi can be deficient, it can be stagnated, it can be rebelling, meaning going the wrong way or the opposite way that she is supposed to be. Or it could be sinking. Now, sinking is always spleen chi sinking, so that's easy. And that's usually prolapse or extreme fatigue. Chi rebelling affects the lung, the stomach, and the liver. So stomach means acid reflux, heartburn, nausea, vomiting. That is all stomach rebelling. Lung rebelling is coughing. And liver rebelling is actually liver young rising, which means it's like the volcano effect. And we have irritability, anger, maybe red eyes, high blood pressure, headaches that is worse at the end of the day and with stress, but feels better with a hot compress. Chi stagnation shows with irritability, <sighs> sighing all the time, moody for women, a lot of PMS, specifically breast tenderness, bloating, constipation, and cold hands as well. That's also a chi stagnation that's not reaching the extremities. 
Qi deficiency is fatigue, weak, a pale tongue, and a weak pulse. Now, depending which organ is affecting, there's more symptoms to it. And that leads me to the next step in our framework, which is the Zhang Fu organs. With the Zhang Fu organs, we are going to refine the diagnosis. Earlier, when we talked about qi stagnation, we know it's liver because liver moves qi. So now liver is qi stagnation. We refined the qi stagnation to liver. If it was a deficiency of qi, is it spleen? Is it lung? Is it kidney? Is it heart? Those are the most common ones. So we look at differentiating the symptoms. If it's spleen qi deficiency, there's going to be digestive system issue. If there's lung qi deficiency, immune system issue. If there's kidney qi deficiency, we're going to have usually lower gait incontinence. So kidney qi is in charge of opening and closing the lower gates. So usually when there is kidney qi deficiency, we may have incontinence or getting up at night to pee a lot of times. And we will have dizziness, of course, fatigue, probably knee pain, low back pain. That's going to show up as well. When it comes to heart qi deficiency, we're going to see abnormal day sweat and anxiety. See how easy it is, right? You refine your diagnosis. If it's blood deficiency, the only three organs that can be blood deficient is heart, spleen, and liver. Because spleen produces blood, liver stores blood, and heart moves blood. So if there is a blood deficiency, it could be either of those. So you can refine your diagnosis a little bit more. Can it be more than one? Of course. Does that make sense? So when it comes to the Zhang Fu organ, we can refine and decide which organ is affected the most according to symptoms, observation, palpation, etc. Yes? The fifth step is figuring out which pathogens are affecting the body. Now, external pathogen invasion is acute, and that can be a common cold, a virus, a bacteria. This is external pathogen invasion. It could be hypothermia or heat stroke or sunburn. That is all external pathogen invasion, which means the pathogen comes in, it's acute, and we may have wind heat, wind cold. We may have damp heat, damp cold. We may have a really, really strong fire. For example, if you have a heat stroke or a sunburn, that's external pathogen fire invading the body, and that creates fever and burn, etc., etc. So that's more for acute, right? It makes sense. Most of the time we see people when they come and it's a chronic issue. So let's talk about internal pathogens. Internal pathogens are going to be five, while external the six, because in external pathogens, we also have summer heat, which doesn't occur in chronic. So in chronic internal pathogens, we're going to have options of wind, cold, heat or fire, damp and dryness. Those are the five. They can be combined, of course. We can have damp cold, damp heat. We can have wind fire, wind cold. All those things can absolutely affect the body. So let's look at examples. When there is internal wind, there's always movement. Remember, wind moves. It can be tremors, ticks, twitches, muscle cramps, spasm. It could be Parkinson's. Anything that's been moving and it's abnormal in the body is internal wind. Dampness is excess body fluid. Dryness is body fluid deficiency. And then we have cold and hot. And again, we talked about this when we talk about the yin yang. So you can have internal cold due to deficiency or excess and internal heat that could be due to excess or deficiency. So now by the time you get to the pathogens, you know which one are in the body. Can we have more than one? Of course, we can have a lot of them. Okay, you still with me? For number six and seven, we are going to look back into the yin yang. When we talked about the yin yang, we said it was acute or chronic. Now, if it's acute, and again, in practice, we don't see as many acute issues, but it's really important to discuss because we obviously can treat family and ourselves when it comes to acute problems. Looking at number six and seven is the six stages and four levels. Those two are a big lecture. The six stages and the four levels both come from classics. TCM classics that were written way back when and are the basis of a lot of our medicine. So the six stages comes from the Shan Han Lun. And don't quote me on my Mandarin pronunciation because after all, I'm French, speaking English, and trying to teach Chinese medicine. 
<laughs> mind blown. So the Shang Han Lun is a really big classic book and it talks about the six stages. And the school of thoughts behind this book is cold invasion would start at the top level stage or at the most superficial stage. And slowly, if the body cannot fight, it can get deeper and deeper through each stage all the way to the bottom stage where it makes everything worse for the person's health. So at the top, which is the Taiyong stage, which affects the bladder and small intestine, it is the most superficial. So the symptoms are not going to be as bad as when it goes all the way down to the Jue Yin stage, which affects the liver and pericardium. So this is a big lecture. I'm not going to go into it, but this is a really interesting one. And it's more for acute at this stage, right? When you see patients, you use this for acute mostly. Not that you can't use it for internal and chronic, but I'm not going to go into it now because it's a big lecture, like I said. When it comes to the four levels, it comes from the classic Wen Bin Shui, which is the school of thought that everything starts with heat. It starts at the Wei level, the defensive Qi level. Heat penetrates and we have a sore throat, and then it gets deeper into the Qi level, and now we have fever. And it can go to the Yin level, Y-I-N-G, which is the nutritive level, and then goes deeper into blood level where we have hallucination, high fever, and it becomes really more dangerous. So those are again are acute, and so I'm gonna let them be for now. Now the next key frame is the three jowls. I think we're still confused how we use the three jowls, the upper jowl, the middle jowl, and the lower jowl. Each of the jowl contain different organs, the zongfu organ. So the upper jowl is heart and lung. The middle jowl is the digestive system, so spleen and stomach. Some school of thought think that liver and gallbladder is also part of the middle jowl. Other school of thoughts will put liver gallbladder at the bottom with kidneys, small intestine, large intestine, and bladder. So I like to put liver gallbladder in the middle just because on the tongue, it's on the side, so it kind of encompasses the middle. That's my school of thoughts, but you have to follow what you think is right. So if someone comes in with dampness in the spleen and heat in the stomach, right? Stomach heat rebelling, so acid reflux, heartburn, bad breath, but at the same time, dampness in the spleen, bloating, loose stools, fatigue, that is a damp heat in the middle jowl. You could still treat the damp in the spleen and the heat in the stomach, but also pick points or choose points from the sand jowl meridian to really consolidate your treatment. That's how we use the three jowls. The last step to this framework is the meridians. The meridians, I think sometimes we forget to use those. Remember that we have a lot of meridians, including dermatomes. And dermatomes are all on the skin. They're the part of the meridian on the skin, right? So if we do have some eczema or a patient has eczema, on the large intestine meridian, now we know the large intestine meridian is affected and we can go deeper into it and see what else is, is being affected. Most often it's going to be the large intestine organ and the lung organ because they are paired and they're part of the immune system and the skin. When you look at meridians, it's really important to know the meridians. For example, the collaterals. The liver collateral starts at liver 5 and goes up in the medial aspect of the thigh and wraps up around the external genitalia. So when there is acute external genitalia issue, like a herpes attack, those are a meridian issue and often it's a liver collateral meridian issue, which means, remember I just said, the liver collateral starts at liver five. We need to use liver five, and liver five is the best point when there is external genitalia issue. By the way, if you haven't seen my Chinese medicine made easy, my green book, it has all the TCM foundation and diagnosis, and it comes with my fillable intake form that you can use on your patients. Check out the link below, and if you haven't got your copy yet, what are you waiting for? <laughs> so the nine step framework starts with the basics, with the yin yang, looks at the five element to figure out which one started it all, then goes into decide which four substances are affected, maybe more than one. And then we refine it with which organ is being affected so we can treat this much more successfully and then we look at, is there pathogens? Do we need to get rid of dampness or heat or cold or wind? 
And then we can look if the upper, middle or lower jowls are affected and use more of the San Jowl Meridian to help our treatment. And then we use the Meridian specifically when there is musculoskeletal or skin problem that we could see is affecting certain Meridian. When it comes to the six stages and the four levels and external pathogens, this is more acute. I truly hope this was useful and you could start using this framework to make the right diagnosis for your patient so then you can come up with the treatment that is the perfect treatment for your patients with a successful outcome. I think the hardest one is the Zong Fu organ. So make sure to watch this video. It'll help you refine your diagnosis when it comes to the Zong Fu. Have a fantastic day and no matter what, keep rocking it using TCM.